It's a five day job, madam, but uh, we're hoping to get it done in 10. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs>thanks for joining us again this is a video that I mentioned uh, we'd be doing some weeks ago this is a whole house installation we're doing of Daikin uh, multi-split air-to-air heat pumps uh, we're having seven units total in this house we're replacing the existing uh, natural gas fired boiler and uh, taking out all the radiators uh, we've got a hot water solution replacement as well which I'll lead on to a little bit later but this is day one of a five-day job we've got uh, most of the gang here and uh, gonna cover uh, how we fit the units, uh, how the units work, and uh, hope you find it enjoyable. Stay with us. Right then, <laughs> world meet Mike. Now, I feel a bit intimidated. That's fine. Because you've been doing YouTube for a long time. Uh, three years. Yeah, yeah. and you've got like 15,000 odd subscribers. That, that would be nice, that's about 14,000. 14, 14, subscribers. Yeah. Yeah. So tell everybody what it is you do. Okay, well, my um, YouTube handle is Mike uh, M0MSN because okay. I'm a radio amateur and do a lot of antenna construction and um, amateur related YouTube videos. So, um, so you yeah. build a lot of like DIY custom made antennas and try different projects. Yes. Mostly on your kitchen table. Yes, that's uh, one of the trademarks. Yeah. <laughs> Break it if you do it in yeah. the kitchen. Yep. And I helped you with one of those once. We soldered up some copper tube and made That's it. right. You made uh, a it, magnetic loop with me. Uh, right. well, in fact, you made it. I just watched yeah. and it was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's one of the, actually, funnily enough, one of the highest um, watched videos that I've got. Is that right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good yeah. job my face wasn't in it then, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It did help. Okay. So you're no strangers to doing this, obviously. No. And most of your videos, what you film right here at home. Yeah, uh, in fact, everything's done either in the kitchen or here in the garden, um, or the uh, for those watching in the states, that's the backyard. Um, so yeah, a lot of it's done here. Um, in fact, most of it is done. I think I've only done two or three videos away from uh, from the home QTH. Uh, yeah, yeah, or home yeah. location. And it amazes me that there's so many people in the world that's still you know really into amateur radio you know you think as time moves on and the internet and everything else you know that older technologies are left mm. behind but I mean there's still a, a huge following for yeah, amateur it's, radio. It's, it's actually quite strange because a lot of the uh, the trailblazing um, tech that's uh, that's out in general purpose was actually invented or should we say trialed within the amateur radio world first right. before it became a commercial product yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's still a lot to learn, still a lot to do. Uh, one of the things about being a radio amateur is that if the third party, that is the cell towers or electricity goes down, we're still able to communicate with each other. Yeah. Yeah. So in the event of the zombie apocalypse and this, so everybody yeah, went to your house. Yeah. yeah. I'll get me tutu out and um, get me radio. And we'll yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, going back to blazing technology. So we're here today. We are taking out your gas condensing boiler, your natural gas condensing boiler and your invented hot water cylinder and we're converting you completely over to Daikin air to air heat pumps yeah, and a hot water solution which I've already alluded to which we'll cover once we get onto that bit later on. Yes. But um, aside from us being mates for 25 years <laughs> uh, and you're having contact. Is it only 25 years? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah it's 25 years, yeah. Um, <laughs> what was it that sort of made you want to choose uh, to go for this right now? Well. The there's two driving forces behind it okay yeah. the first one was we wanted to be um, more carbon neutral do yeah. our bit for the planet if you like and yeah. i know that sounds very but it, it is, it no, is not I, th I think it is a you know one of those things that we all have to strive towards now uh, regardless um you know we are uh, on the edge of that that apocalypse it might not be a zombie one but we're on the edge of yeah. a, a, you know a, yeah. a problem with far the, more frightening the two isn't it absolutely yeah. so you know if we can do our bit we'll do our bit um, and secondly, uh, I'll be honest with you, it's uh, running costs as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay, we are uh, in the UK at the moment um, suffering from um, a rather high inflation and energy cost yeah, we are. Uh, spike. Yeah. Um, and although this is costing um, a reasonable amount of money to install, yeah. the, uh, the fact is that we are now intending to stay in this property for perhaps for the next 20 years or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. And going forward, we want to see our energy costs 
um, plateau, if you like, or, or stabilize. Yeah. Now, as gas keeps going up in, in price at the moment, and I can't see that changing in the very near future, no. um, the, the answer for us was to go all electric. And as we're partially solar as well, we can control the price of that, uh, yeah. of, of that heating, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is, touching on the solar, that is a nice thing, that you can grow your own electricity and help offset your usage yeah. uh, with, with your air-to-airs here. So in the UK at the moment, we're on capped gas and electric rates. We're paying, I think, about 34 pence per 30, kilowatt. 34, 35, yeah, something like that. Per yeah. kilowatt hour for gas. And around yeah. 10, uh, sorry, no, I beg your pardon, 34 pence for electricity and about 10 pence for uh, gas uh, per kilowatt yeah per kilowatt so we would want our seasonal coefficient of performance of these units to be in excess of three to three point four yep. if that makes sense yep. so that would put them on a, a cost balance the daikin units that were fit in here they've got a seasonal coefficient of performance in excess of five brilliant so you know, they're 500 percent efficient if yep. you like so they're already going to you know beat no I know that, sorry for interrupting you, but I know that there are two um, stated coefficients. Mm. There's just the COP, which is the uh, yeah. uh, coefficient factor. Yeah, and which then is taken out of a fixed set of parameters. And then yeah. there's an S uh, COP. COP. So yeah. what's the difference between those? May okay, so COP is the coefficient of performance at a given temperature and a given humidity, humidity. So in one fixed operating mode, in one set of fixed operating conditions. And then the seasonal coefficient of performance is taken over an entire heating season. So the SCOP is the more representative example of typical yeah, usage. Yeah, okay, so that's yeah. kind of an average over the year. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. So, so with air-to-air -air heat pumps such as this, they have two stated seasonal efficiencies. And one which uh, our American cousins might be more familiar with is the one we use for cooling and they use for cooling is called SEER, which is S-E-E-R, which is seasonal energy efficiency ratio. And we use that to express the efficiency performance of this unit in cooling. Right. So your unit has two stated efficiencies or your units have two stated efficiencies. They have the SCOP, which is for heating mode and the SEER, the SEER for cooling mode. Uh, and both of these, the SEER is actually higher. They're actually more efficient in cooling operation than they are in, in heating operation. And that leads us on to the other thing is, um, the simple fact is, you know, we've just had a really wicked summer, haven't we? No, we've absolutely. Had an incredibly it was lovely, hot yeah. summer. And uh, the benefit of these units, of course, is that not only are they going to provide you with really energy efficient heating, they're going to provide you with you know, amazing cooling through the, the summer months as well. Yeah. Now, these are air sourced heat pumps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the version that we've gone for is air to air. Yes over air to water exactly right yeah okay now the air to water i understand does the hot water but yeah. is actually um, perhaps less efficient for heating the house than the air to air but i could be wrong with that um, i think it's it's a horse for course if you like yeah it is so the reason air to air is so efficient uh two sort of main driving factors really one is that air to air operates at lower differential temperatures. So the fan coils don't need to get particularly hot. They, the refrigerant only needs to get to sort of 29, 30, maybe up to 35 degrees to perform great in the house and keep the fan coils warm. Um, whereas an air to water system, air to water with underfloor heating, that's only running at say 40 or 45 degrees is pretty efficient. But if you've got to make a, an air source heat pump, heat water to 55 degrees or above for radiators, that's when the efficiency starts to drop yeah. off. So the whole, whole thing with energy efficiency with heat pumps is all about differential temperature. It's about the temperature of the air outside and the temperature you're trying to achieve. So the bigger that differential is, the more the efficiency drops off. That's why air to air is so efficient. And the other thing as well is, which I think is often overlooked, is that an air to air system such as this is a closed loop system. So the indoor and outdoor units are connected to each other all by refrigerant pipework and their own interconnecting electric cables. And there are thermistors uh, on each of the units. So yep. all, the fan coils have three or four thermistors. They're constantly looking at the humidity in the room, the temperature in the room, the temperature of the refrigerant, and they're corresponding with that data with the outdoor unit. So it's a completely closed loop system. It knows what its target temperature is. It knows what its room temperature is. It knows the humidity inside. It knows exactly what it's doing. So it's a closed loop system. So in respect then, you're not actually wasting energy as well because with a hot water um, 
radiator system. It's taking a lot more heat to bring those radiators up to the temperature you need in the room. Yeah, exactly. And right. then when it reached temperature, you still got wasted hot water, if you like, uh, in in the system. Yeah. Uh, am, am I am, am I right in thinking that? Yeah, yeah. Where there, this has got more control of keeping the room exactly, at temperature. Exactly right. So yeah. so is what you'll notice is when you first turn the units on is that the response time is incredible. Yeah. They'll, they'll be producing hot air from the fan coils within one to two minutes. And the same in cooling mode, they really are really quick to respond. Yeah. And um, you'll notice that the refrigerant temperature, um, we talk about refrigerant, but heating, you know, I know it sounds yeah, it's, backwards, it's, it's, but the, ref yeah. the refrigerant <laughs> is obviously at higher temperature when it's in heating mode. That refrigerant will initially come up to quite a higher temperature, but as the room warms up and that return air temperature comes up, the refrigerant temperature will modulate down and the fan speed of the indoor unit will modulate down with it. And that's another beautiful thing about these units is everything is capable of modulating. Yep. We see on these boxes and we see on um, all, all this sort of heat pump equipment nowadays, it's all inverter, it's all, you know, inverter this, inverter that. It just means that the compressor inside this, the scroll compressor, and the fan unit and the indoor fan unit in the coil, they're all capable of ramping up and down to meet their load requirement. And that's another part of that closed loop system is the fact that the thermistors and the demand on the system, they all help to keep the energy use as absolutely as low as possible. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, right, I'll let you get on because I, right. I can tell that everyone's so uh, it's needing you to do some work. It's a, it's a five day job, this is day one. Yep. Um, I'm hoping we'll get it done in 10 days. That's fine, mate. <laughs> <laughs> if, you do it, if you do it any slower, I mean quicker, I, uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> okay, well look, thanks very much, Mike. No let's, problem. Um, let's get on and do some work. So here are our ports. That's a pair, that's a pair, that's a pair, that's a pair. So we've got... Uh, Obviously the out and return. Yeah, so yeah, I, we call it a liquid and gas line or high and low side, um, but essentially yeah, flow and return if you like. So you've got pair there, pair there, pair there, pair there. Um, each, so each fan coil is made off to each individual pair set and then the wiring here corresponds. You can see here we've got five sets of wiring blocks. This is our main power supply. So the way it works is we have main power coming onto this set of terminal, terminals here and then each indoor unit is wired back to each corresponding set of terminals here. So the power to the indoor units is taken from the outdoor unit and the way that works is we've got live and neutral and then the third wire, which is 0 to 230 volts potential, is what carries our communications. So the outdoor unit and the internal units can correspond and send each other uh, data. Let's move on. Let's talk about brackets. So, as we mentioned earlier, we are going to be fitting your unit on a bracket. And this is a 140 kilo or 300 pound bracket. It's colour coded the same as the Daikin unit, as you can see, they're colour matched. I tell you what, that's some very serious um, um, yeah, these thick are, material, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, these are really heavy duty. I mean, this is what we would call a large bracket. We could get away with a medium bracket on this, but I like these, they're nice and wide. The units really don't move with these on, really good. Absolutely. When you screw the bracket up to the wall like we've just done, yeah. if you were to just have that level a minute, just for anybody who's going to be putting one of these up themselves, you'll notice that they're slightly leading edge high. And even if you 
kind of like jump on the front of them, they're always leading edge high. But when you actually put the load on, put the yeah, outdoor unit on, they down. will naturally crank back a little bit. So that's what these back feet are, are for, so we can actually jack it back up a little bit, okay? And we're now gonna just contemplate where we're gonna take the trunk in. So I believe the best route is gonna be vertically straight down to a low level, probably a, me the the a meter of the above the ground level, mm -hmm. and come round at low level through there and up and into the unit that way. This is my new commissioning shed. This is where he has his sandwiches. It is lunchtime and there are no sandwiches. I would just add that. <laughs> Dinner time. Look at the size of those pigs. Did you say look at the size of those pecs? No. <laughs> they ain't nice bag. In actual fact, this has got to be the first. You've got a you've got a bag here that is more than adequate for what's there. Usually, the bag is too small for what goes in it. That's actually a really good point because normally you can't get anything back in no. a bag or a box, can you? No. There, there, in this bag, there was at least six inches left at the end of it. Well, well, the size of that. That's the bottom there. Probably. That's the bottom. Right, so top of it. Yeah. I think you just lift yeah. it up, and push it out like so. Oh, well done. It's a two-man kite. Yeah. Whoop, this is all good fun, isn't it? <laughs> like that. Nice. Pull it up. That's it. Push it out. That's it. And put those down. Then push that one up. You'll pull it, isn't it? Like so. That's a comedy go one. Ryan, you must have the easy side. That's ace. That's ace. Well, it said 30 seconds, but it's the first time, isn't it? Hey, it's well made. That's unusual, isn't it? You don't normally last as long on your first time. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> well, here we are. Uh, a huge amount of rain this morning. Um, really glad that I've got this little tent here. I've managed to hide all the kit away in there. I don't mind getting wet myself, but when all the tools start getting wet, it gets a little bit too much but made some good progress this morning. We've got all four of the line set pairs ready to go, ready to connect onto our manifolds here. All I need to do is to uh, put the flare nuts on and get these flared up, get them joined onto the manifold, torque them down, and then we can put some nitrogen on the system. And I'll talk you through what I do on the tightness test. Uh, once we're happy with that, we'll go around and do a final inspection on the indoor units, get the uh, insulation tidied up on those and get those clipped back onto the wall. And uh, once that's done, we can proceed to uh, vacuum the system down and then uh, charge it with refrigerant. Let's get to it.
there we have it. That's all eight of our copper lines joined up now, uh, all talked up. So time to get some nitrogen and start doing our pressure test. We're up to 10 bar, we'll give it 10 minutes. Uh, ultimately, I need to take this up to 30 bar, but uh, there's no point in wasting nitrogen. If we've got a leak at 10 bar, we need to address that now. So we'll just give it the full 10 minutes duration. We're at two minutes now. And subject to that being okay, we'll raise the pressure up to 30 bar, around about 440, 450 PSI. And uh, we'll leave that probably overnight now and uh, keep a time tightness test running on it, make sure everything's okay. And we've still got to check the flare unions at the indoor units as well too. So uh, we'll do that. Our 10 minute 10 bar pressure test was fine. Now we've raised the pressure to 30 bar. Uh, for Mike's uh, benefit, we put the pressure units over to PSI just to give him a better idea, because uh, he's old. 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 Yeah. old, old yeah. So yeah, 450 PSI. We're gonna start the test off now, and we'll leave that on overnight and see what it's doing in the morning. Well, here we are back again for day three. It's uh, around about nine o'clock in the morning. We've got a lovely day uh, forecast today, real contrast to yesterday's deluge that we had. We actually drove home uh, last night through absolute torrential rain. So uh, yeah, typical mid-November in uh, the UK, it's a bit up and down the weather. But uh, here we are with our pressure test. This has been running 17 hours, so been going all overnight. And we're at 448.8 PSI. So uh, we on our gauge actually shows we've gained two PSI because the temperature compensation, um, our temperature probes are connected outside here. So the temperature compensation has been based on external temperature. But obviously there've been temperature fluctuations inside the house, which have been exerting onto the fan coils as well. So there needs to be a little bit of interpretation when it comes to uh, reading and understanding the pressure test. But the simple fact of the matter is, um, it's not lost any pressure overnight. We've done the uh, visual inspections with uh, non-corrosive leak detection fluid on the internal joints on the indoor unit, so we know there's, they're all good, there's no micro bubble in there, and uh, we've had a really good long pressure test as well. So next step is now to vent this nitrogen that's in the system away and uh, get the equipment under vacuum. So we'll connect at the vacuum uh, pump and the vacuum gauges and get this vac down. Okay, well, we've just got it arrived today, Wednesday, middle of the week, and we're dismantling the current flue system from the boiler that is in the utility next door. Ryan here, he's going to be draining down and uh, removing of said heating system, um, whilst I am just preparing to put the final um, leg of an Arbidenka trunk in around to pick up the hall um, air conditioning unit and um, then it's only down to uh, Mr Hill to carry on and fit the outdoor unit at the other end and then all pipe work is done. No lunch, just straight through. I want some more. Till 8pm yeah? 8pm. Okay. We've got rain, we rain got all. torches, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Fleming. Now that our pressure test has been completed and I've vented off all of the nitrogen in the system, we can begin to put the system under vacuum. So here's our vacuum pump. This is a Navtech battery powered vacuum pump. Really quiet, very powerful little pump. Uh, we tend to use this on most split and multi-split systems. Really no need for a big mains powered pump. Now that's linked by a large bore evacuation hose to our valve core removal tools and isolation valves. And then finally we have our vacuum gauge here at the moment you can see that's just reading dashes there's uh, there's no vacuum being applied now I've also got a separate extra connection here and that is for my nitrogen I've got a small amount of positive nitrogen pressure in that blue hose now the reason for that is because I'm going to be doing a triple evacuation on this system when I vented off the nitrogen uh, from the service port here just a few moments ago I had quite a lot of moisture being driven out with it now, when we did most of the pipe work yesterday, the system, uh, or should I say the uh, weather was very wet. Um, 
a lot of humidity in the air so there is going to be a lot of humidity and moisture in the pipework now as we put the system under vacuum that moisture is going to boil off and that's going to take time so we will put the system in a first state of vacuum then we'll break that vacuum with nitrogen vacuum again break with nitrogen again and then put the system under a final deep state of vacuum so that's what that third connection here is for nitrogen so let's get the pump started up and uh, get our first stage vacuum underway. I've had the system on vacuum now for about uh, an hour, down to 105 microns, which is pretty low. Uh, normally get it to around about 250, so yeah, that's absolutely fine, 100 microns. I'll do a decay test on that shortly. Uh, while I've been doing the vacuum, I've wired the system up, so you can see our four indoor units connected in that uh, square block and our power supply is connected. I uh, just need to put a rotary isolator on the system now and also Mike's supplied uh, an inline DIN rail mounted energy meter to monitor the system energy usage. They do have energy usage monitoring in the app but uh, Mike decided he wanted also to have uh, something a little bit more hardwired to give him some uh, extra data. So just going to wire that in now and uh, finish this vacuum uh, test off and get some refrigerant into the system. Day five. It is, and uh, finally completed. Yeah, it's been a big job, hasn't it? Yeah, and uh, do you know what? I couldn't be more pleased to be okay. honest with you. Well, you had, really one, nice. you had one system up and running last night. Yes, I so did. So this system was running last night, so this one's running four. So you had your lounge, your two bedrooms. Yep. Yeah, and... And I think it's the kitchen uh, as well. And the kitchen, yep. yeah. Okay, so lounge, kitchen, and a couple of bedrooms working last night so you kindly helped and put some of the units on your app so you've now got the Daikin Onecta app that's so correct you've got control yep. over the units on I'll, those I'll put an insert actually for those of you for, to see that but yeah come on. yeah and you've got localized remote controls for each individual unit which if you're like me you probably won't end up using them. I think uh, they've been put in the cupboard already to be honest but. yeah yeah so uh, the other unit, the opposite side of the high school picture separately, that's running three indoor units. That's another two bedrooms and also the main uh, entrance hallway. That's correct, yeah. And that one we've just shortly, just about half an hour ago, sort of got that one commissioned and yes, up and running. all up and running and it's working wonderfully. Yeah. And our hot water solution that we keep alluding to. <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, we'll picture that one separately and we'll do an, another piece with that, I think, in a little yep. while. We'll stick to the Daikin. Perhaps the next uh, video perhaps the next video we can talk about hot water indeed and why you didn't go for heat pump technology a little spoiler there but something a bit different to the norm yes absolutely yeah. i think we've gone over in general how the system operates how, how it's going to work for you yes so we're going to be invited back for a revisit in a month or so to see how you're getting on with it yes please do come back all right um and uh, i'm going to keep a record as well over the next uh, month of um its power consumption yeah um, so I can gauge it against what we would have had the same time last year yeah. um, with gas. Yeah. Um, I know we are perhaps a little bit more um, in the benefit of extra heat because we're not as cold as we should be. No, um, no but it's been quite mild, hasn't it? It, it has been, yeah. so um, I could put a, probably put that more eloquently. Yeah. But yeah, it's not as cold this year as it was last, so it's going to be a little bit of disparity. Yeah. But, um, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah we can certainly see what it's like. I, I'm aware that my energy consumption in the respect of electricity is going to go up compared to last year. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's the it's the overall um, the whole the whole picture. Exactly. Gas and electricity. So we're not using as much gas. So hopefully that will compensate for the amount of electricity yeah. we'll be using. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to it. I'm actually yeah. you know it's these these things just going on what happened over the last 24 hours with the heat that's generated from this. Yeah. It's an unbelievable amount of heat. Yeah. Um, and I can see that on the meter I've got behind me, we've used um, about 10 kilowatts. That's including yeah. our commissioning runs as well. Exactly. Yeah. So, we've so that's an interesting point to make, actually. Uh, not all the systems we fit would have a small DIN rail mounted hardwired energy meter. Obviously, you've supplied those. Yep for your installation and i've got those on my installation as well and it was quite interesting because i compared the energy consumption which is uh, displayed in the Daikin app yes to my hard wired meters and did they uh, match and they were very very close i think one was four percent one was maybe four or five percent but they, they were really really close yep. um which is quite reassuring really strangely i did exactly the same and right uh, this is within Oh, I don't know, 200 watts. Yeah, okay. So, well, yeah. mine was done over pretty much over a year. Um, but the nice thing about the Daikin app is it tell you what your energy consumption is by room. Yes. And it'll tell you the energy com consumption split between heating and cooling as well. So you can see your total cooling load over the year. And it's all graphed based. You can do it by room or by whole house. It's really clever, neat app, actually. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see how you fare with that. Indeed. Uh, Alrighty. Really impressed. Really happy with the quality of the craftsmanship and work. Thank it's you. It's been fabulous having you here and i'm so pleased that uh, you know i've got the thanks very in. much check in the post yes indeed. <laughs> <laughs> all right mike well thank you very much let's get cleared up and cheers, let's get mate. going yes Cheers. Indeed. Thanks. thanks a lot